completely different. It's a great pleasure to announce our next speaker, whose life really turned a completely unexpected turn when he decided to leave Sweden and a very prominent business career and become a forest monk, Buddhist monk in Thailand. So it's a great pleasure to invite Bjorn Natiko Lindeblad on the stage. Welcome. if you can hear me. Hmm. I have engineer karma. I've talked at Chalmers twice, I've talked at Ericsson once before, I was at Lund's Tekniska Högskola yesterday. Don't know why. I just get on with engineers. <laughs> so my plan today is to speak for about 70 minutes, 75 minutes, obviously about my journey. Hopefully not just to tell a story about the journey, but also to pass on bits of insights, experiences I've had where I felt I learned something or saw things in a different way. And uh, then we'll leave five or ten minutes at the end for questions. And in terms of topics, I expect to speak about intuition. Seems to be something people are interested in right now. Ethics. Obviously stillness its connection to intuition. And there'll be lots of things that I had no plan to speak about that I'll end up speaking about. When you look bored, that's why I need to look at you and see what you look like. I'll change my tack and go on to a different, different line. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to start today, um, Sunday afternoon, late, maybe 87, I'd been running through Stockholm School of Economics and got my MBA. Graduated in the mid-80s. Most of you look like you were around in those days too. You can remember any semi-intelligent human being with a university degree and a nice portfolio could get a nice job. <laughs> Even me. So I was living in Spain in a nice house by the sea with the usual external symbols of success, the house and the car and the secretary and all that. And I was about to become, a few months later, the youngest CFO, chief financial officer, of an AGA company ever. AGA was a, used to be a Swedish company. It was a great employer. But I was unhappy. I was successful but unhappy. I was in the wrong place. I'd listened too much to other people's opinions. My father was immensely proud when I got into Stockholm School of Economics. I had very little idea of where I would fit in in working life, so I thought, why not? And as many of you may recognize, once you start an education, you do your best, push yourself, you don't want to fail. And I kept running. And three years of running at Stockholm School of Economics, another three years running in the business world, I was running out of steam. It's almost like, you know that feeling when you've driven yourself for too hard for too long and much of, what you, what, much of what's driving you is discipline, willpower, the hope to look successful in other people's eyes, the fear of failure and a vague anticipation that at some future date it's going to turn out all right. <laughs> I think more than a few of us drive ourselves by these assumptions and conditions. And if we do it too long, it doesn't work. It doesn't feed us where we need to be fed. It's superficial. My latest simile to describe what this does to us, it's like, in Swedish, it's like eating too much small goodies, living exclusively on little candies. <laughs> it's colorful, it's got a sparkle. <laughs> Short-term satisfaction, but it actually doesn't nourish us. So that period was coming to an end for me. I do my tie, put on my suit, bathroom mirror every morning, give myself a really fake smile in the mirror and say, it's showtime, folks. <laughs> and every day this almost growing panic at the management meetings, trying to construct an opinion in the management meetings at things where I had no opinion and no interest. <laughs> 
So I was laying in my little sofa that I'd brought along from Sweden. It was Sunday afternoon. Sunday anguish was starting to arise. I had recently finished reading a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Didn't really understand the book, but I was impressed with some of the ideas in it. And it seemed to indicate that there was some value in the spaces between thought, as if the quiet mind, the still mind, actually had some value. And I wasn't feeling so well, and so I thought, I'll try that. I'll just lean into the little spaces between my thoughts. And things quietened down just a little, nothing spectacular, nothing big. Things just quietened down a little inside, and that felt restful. And then a thought arose, and the thought said something like, it's time to move on. And I would describe this thought as belonging to the kind of thoughts that we call intuition. It seems we human beings have at least two ways of coming to conclusions. One is reason, you know, one thought leads to another, leads to another, and we come to a conclusion, I'll do like this. That's reason. It's a wonderful gift that human beings have. Um, it rarely surprises. And then we have this other capacity called intuition, where something inside of us constellates what you feel, what you think, what you hope, what you fear, and perhaps even a magical ingredient X, and usually from a relatively still point inside comes a wonderful idea. And intuition very often surprises you. Can you follow this? Like, you know, simple daily example, you're looking for something you've mislaid and you're desperately trying to find it and then you kind of stop looking because something else comes in the way and sometime later just a thought arises from nowhere in your mind. Ah, yeah, the keys are there. <laughs> yeah? So we have this rather mysterious ability that something arises out of seemingly nothing. You talk to any person with a creative vocation I imagine I heard about 70% of you are programmers and as far as I understand programming requires quite a bit of creativity. So I imagine in the creative process a few of you probably recognize this mysterious way that my best ideas come about. Mm -hmm. I remember the process after this wonderful idea that completely surprised me. It took about Ten seconds and I realized, yes, this is what I'm going to do. And then I started thinking, now let's see, how can I construct some arguments so that I look, so that I sound intelligent and reasonable in other people's ears? <laughs> and I think it's also worth pointing out that no matter how good our arguments are for our big life decisions, often perhaps the decisions come before the arguments. So don't get lost in the arguments. Hmm? I remember when I had to go to the boss, when I made up my mind and knock on his door and say, this is it, I'm leaving. Calling my parents, I had no plan B, I only knew what I didn't want to do, I didn't know what I wanted to do. They were worried. I was usually, have always been a person who's rather concerned by what other people think about me. Often looking worriedly above my shoulders how other people react to what I say and do. And in this process, I didn't quite recognize myself, because I was inflappable, <laughs> unwavering. Yeah? Nice English words for this state of, I'm upright, I know where I'm going, I'm not looking sideways a whole lot. And I would say that's one of the characteristics of intuition. It's one of the aspects of following your deepest voice, letting all of yourself participate, and come to some sort of life decision. When you follow that voice inside, your most sane, grounded, personal voice, my experience is you tend to be a lot less concerned with what other people think. And for me, that was wonderful. <laughs> Got home to Sweden, social journey. A month later, we're doing the dishes in a fancy restaurant called Longe Dogs Vatrufs outside of Gothenburg. Dishwasher always has to arrive early and then the waiters come later and one of the waiters says to the other in heavy Gothenburg accent, Hey, does the new dishwasher speak Swedish or what? <laughs> this kind of ego, hurt ego. I used to be important. <laughs> People used to treat me with respect. 
Um, and of course, people ask, how did you think? You had everything that most people look for, now you're washing dishes. And being a person who likes people to like me, I would try to give a full explanation. But more and more I noticed, every time I gave this full explanation, I started hesitating and doubting my own decision a little bit more. Why? Well, I didn't sound very convincing. But of course, I was presenting the arguments that I'd come up with after my decision <laughs> to sound intelligent in other people's heads and ears. So that's another, I'm not so sure I should give any advice in a situation like this, but if I were to give advice, I would say, if you make a big life decision, be careful with how much you feel you have to explain yourself to everybody around you. Because what tends to happen is you, you tend to start to doubt your own decision. Mm. So it was great, coming back to Sweden, wearing jeans again, doing what I want, studying literature, classical literature. I was 11, nine month marathon race through world literature. <laughs> but what was even better coming home was one day on the tram on the way to university, I saw signs advertising a survival hotline. And I thought, well, I've never done any voluntary work, I'll try that. So I got some training, and I did four-hour uh, evenings, Thursdays, between 7 and 11. I would sit at the phone at this voluntary organization. It's a worldwide organization. It's called Samaritans, I think. And I would listen to people who needed somebody to speak to. That's what it was called. Nogona Talame, somebody to speak to. And in the beginning, even though we got good training beforehand. I did the same mistake as many women here will recognize men often doing when we try to listen empathetically. I tried to give advice. <laughs> but I'd, I'd listened to my teachers, so after a while I realized, could you please shut up and just listen? <laughs> and on a personal level, it was deeply meaningful because I'd grown up privileged, sunny side of the street, and now I was exposed to the other side of my hometown, a social misery, a kind of brutality of destiny for many people, a loneliness that I didn't think exist. Old people who called often women who their grown their adult children hadn't seen them for decades. And I would listen to these life stories and I'd come to the end of them and please don't laugh now because that's not what I'm intending. And I would hear myself think, yes, I realize that the idea of killing yourself is not so far out. I can understand that. But of course, we were never told, we, we couldn't say that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I discovered doing this was the, uh, the magic of compassion. Once I learned to shut up and not give advice, <laughs> once I learned to actually open up myself as much as I could, stop that part in me that wanted to formulate something about what they were saying, stop that part of me that wanted not to feel what they were describing because it was so uh, unpleasant. And I could just surrender into something more spacious and generous and, yeah, I feel some of what you're describing. It was deeply f meaningful for me. First of all, I noticed they felt so lightened. You know that feeling when you're with somebody you're really burdened, and this person is really listening to you. <laughs> and they're not having an opinion about you. They're not trying to solve your problem. They're not trying to make you cheer up and look at the bright side. <laughs> they're not making you feel like a neurotic, miserable, emotional failure. They're actually just there, quietly, open, and trying to feel some of what you're feeling. This is deeply transformative. And I imagine most people have had that experience. Sometimes we maybe we've even been able to be that for somebody else. For the times that's happened to me when I've been deeply troubled, I don't think I'll forget that. I'll remember that. Mm -hmm. So, naturally, people come to the end of their story, yeah. They, they're moved by the tragedy of their destiny, so they start crying because of that sometimes. 
slowly I started realizing actually probably just as often tears are falling because they're just so grateful somebody listened to them without turning them into a problem or a failure mm. and for me it was such a revelation because basically you know I have a fairly strong or used to have strong inner critic that voice sitting on your shoulder telling you why you're not good enough and one of the things my inner critic was saying you're not intelligent enough so when I started sitting in these Thursday evenings I thought I have to come up with intelligent things to say and slowly I realized all I have to do is sit here and take in this person's reality with as little reservation and resistance I can. And that was wonderful. I can actually offer something deeply meaningful to other people without having to be so smart. And then noticing, yeah, the effect on them was wonderful. And then the effect on myself. I would step out into the 11 o'clock autumn of Gothenburg yeah, I feel five, six centimeters taller. There's life in my chest. I feel warm. I feel big. I don't feel so separate anymore. And, you know, you have to remember, I just lived in Spain for years. I was a bit flamboyant. <laughs> I'd climb onto the tram on my way home to start talking to strangers and try to share the joy. <laughs> we don't do that in Gothenburg. <laughs> Unless you're drunk <laughs> or a kid. <laughs> yeah. So this was like, uh, what I discovered here, of course, was compassion and the effect it had on me. And some general sense of, okay, I was still a young man looking for a professional career. <clears throat> so I directed my energies towards development work. So I got a job with the uh, United Nations as an economist in India. I'm not going to say much about that today, but... I always say this thing that I'm going to say now, so I must be fairly proud of it. <laughs> if you Google on my name, the earliest hits you'll find is as something of an international authority on financial analysis of small-scale seaweed culture. <laughs> so if you want to know more about that, just come up to me after the talk. <laughs> on my way to um, India, I backpacked in uh, Southeast Asia, starting with uh, walking for three weeks in the Himalayas. After that, I felt strong as a mountain goat, having carried my 15 kilo rucksack for three weeks. Sat down in a restaurant in Kathmandu, beautiful girl on the other side, Haley, medical student from Johannesburg. We fell in love. We traveled to Thailand, had about maybe two weeks of. Hollywood romance on a beach. And then something started to shut down in me. It's an after construction, but I'm fairly certain that I was starting to feel, I think I like her more than she likes me. <laughs> there is a real fear of rejection here. And those of you who've been through that, you know that when we are afraid of being rejected, something starts to close down. And so I became very unspontaneous and square. I couldn't play or joke or she asked me, what do you feel? How are you? I don't know. I just feel numb. So we broke up. It was very sad. It was also somewhat comical because I was alone in this tropical paradise. Everywhere around me I had young, you know, backpackers, Western backpackers mainly, young, beautiful, romantically inclined, playful, happy people. <laughs> and then me. <laughs> I was hiding behind a hardcover uh, book. It was Dostoevsky's Karamazov Brothers. <laughs> I was trying to look serious and intellectual and self-sufficient. And it took maybe a week. I had this real epiphany, this insight. Goodness me, when I'm sad, depressed, alone, despairing, confused. I have no tools. I haven't got a clue what to do when I'm feeling bad. And I couldn't help making the reflection, what kind of culture did I grow up in? Why didn't we have time? Life, life sciences, life knowledge from day one in school. When I said this once a few months ago, a woman came up afterwards and said, actually, they do now. They have Livskunskap. Mm -hmm. They actually learn in Swedish schools, some schools anyway, 
from seven, eight years old, what to do when you're sad, what to do when you're lonely, what to do when you're afraid. Wonderful. So that was my first movement towards Buddhism, a vague sense of, well, the Buddha statues here in Thailand are beautiful, Thai people seem to have some lightness of being that I can't find in my Scandinavian compatriots. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the monks looked happy and relaxed. So I went to a monastery outside of Chiang Mai, wonderfully unrealistic expectations. I was sitting there in day two of a month-long retreat, meditation retreat. Okay, when's the cosmic orgasm coming? <laughs> when's the inner firework beginning? I'm ready, bring it on. <laughs> and after a few days I realized, oh, well, that's not actually what the Buddha offers. <laughs> that's not really what's uh, offered here. And a normal meditation session in the beginning for me would be like, okay, breathing in, breathing out. Oh, she's quite pretty, that girl over there. I wonder if she's as peaceful as she looks. Come on, come on, shut up, shut up now. Get back to business. Come on, meditate, okay. Breathing in, breathing out. This is fine. This is going great. Ah, present awareness is never further away than the next breath. Come on, yeah. Breathing in, breathing out. I wonder what's for lunch today. <laughs> it really wasn't much to write home about yesterday. I mean, we feed dogs better food than that in Sweden. I mean, these people, they should think raw food, vegan, macrobiotic. Please, climb into the 90s. Shut up, come on, meditate. Okay, okay, here we go, here we go. Focus, focus, yeah, here we go. Breathing in, breathing out. Oh shit, only 15 minutes gone. 30 minutes left, oh no. It's like this kind of innocent misunderstanding of, okay, peace, serenity, tranquility, stillness. That must mean all my thoughts must stop. So who can do that? Well, I have to do that. <laughs> so I call this fly swatting meditation. <laughs> Basically, you're just, you know what a fly swat is? You're killing flies with? I would sit there with my inner fly swat and any thought that arose in my consciousness, I just zap. <laughs> and it doesn't work. Just like anything else that's alive and sensitive, our mind does not respond well to oppression. <laughs> it responds uh, in many ways. Mind responded in a particular kind of rebellion it started playing the same song over and over and over again, <laughs> which was maybe a little bit fun for the first five or ten times. Kind of sad after fifty times and deeply sad after a hundred or two hundred times. And the Swedish people here will know what the song is. It was the uh, theme song of Fablenas Vad. <laughs> so this is one way to torture the human mind, I can tell you that. So day four, I ran away from the monastery, feeling like a failure again. But something had awoken in me. I was deeply impressed with the people I met in the Buddhist world, Western, Eastern. They seemed to speak about things that I'd been interested in, spoke about things that I even never thought about, but I became interested in. Like many Western Buddhists, I read a lot of books. And Buddhism is often presented as the intelligent person's religion because it dovetails perfectly with modern physical research, quantum research being one, quantum theory being one example. And the Buddha very strongly underlined that I'm not requiring blind faith of any kind. I really encourage you to reflect, reason, investigate for yourself. So that appeals to the Western skeptical mind. But actually, that's not how Buddhism drew me in. For me, it was just a, a movement from the heart. I just liked it. I just found it beautiful, uplifting, a vague sense of there's something here for me that I don't quite understand. I do a few more trips to Thailand. A year later, I worked for Greenpeace in Sweden, took a month, did the whole course in Thailand. Came back, starry-eyed, born-again, young, idealist Buddhism, Buddhist, declared to my parents, now I'm going to full live after the five rules that all good lay Buddhists should live by. 
One of them was not drinking alcohol. This was radical <laughs> where I came from, really radical <laughs> and deeply provocative to some of my friends. <laughs> you know that funny thing where you do something just because that's what you want to do and then other people interpret it as if, oh, so you think everybody should be like that, huh? No. <laughs> I'm just decided that I'm not going to drink beer anymore. That doesn't mean I have a deeply critical perception of everybody who has a glass of beer every now and then. Like at the bar, after work, Friday evening. Okay, so what's wrong with having a beer then, Bjorn? Nothing. <laughs> and the moment came where it's classical conversation between me and my mother. They'd slowly see me go more and more funny. So it wasn't a total surprise for them, but I'd tell mom over the table in our kitchen, uh, Mom, I'm going to be a forest Buddhist monk. Okay. <laughs> Ever met a Buddhist monk? Ever met a forest monk? No, no. Ever been to a forest monastery? No, no. Are you really sure about this? Yes. And it was cool because it was that same intuitive side of me that decided and my mother could hear it. She was usually used to me as being somebody who's quite vacillating, quite hesitant, not really sure I would take a decision and go back. And now she could just hear it in my voice. I knew what I was doing. There was one point in questioning it. You know that feeling when you take a decision from a fairly deep place inside? Other people can hear that you've already made up your mind. They're not as likely to question. Can you follow me here? Yeah? There's something in us that knows when somebody's standing in their own truth. It's a, it's a sadly overlooked quality. I sometimes quote Einstein because he's so eminently quotable. And one of his quotes I like the best is, um, Reason is a servant. Intuition is a gift. We've created a culture where we've made a master of the servant but forgotten the gift. You follow? I guess I'm, I'm hoping I'm not the only one seeing... It's almost like the culture has become too cerebral. Reason has too much room. You can see that in how we treat old people, sick people, poor people, young people. There's too much brain and not enough heart in how we treat them. And perhaps it's easier to see in other people. We know what it's like when we're with somebody who has no connection with their intuitive side. I mean, in a way, you get paid for producing bright ideas, so perhaps, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's an aside. Let me instead quote Winnie the Pooh. This is one of the wisdom traditions I lean on. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh and Piglet, they were out walking. Do you know Winnie the Pooh? Yeah? He and Piglet, they're out walking, as they do. They pass Owl's house. You know, Owl lives in a tree. As they pass Owl's house, Piglet says with lots of admiration in his voice, Owl, he knows a lot of things. Winnie the Pooh is quiet for a while. And then he says, Yeah, maybe that's why he never understands anything. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that you don't know is a small problem. Thinking that you know is a big problem. Mm. When you're with somebody who thinks they know, when you're with somebody who's out of touch with intuition, to me, one of the similes I think of is like, it's da like dancing, trying to dance with somebody who can't hear the music. <laughs> yeah, they're doing the right steps and the arms are moving vaguely in the right order, but they can't hear the music. We lose our ability to play, to joke, to improvise, to meet unexpected circumstance. I know the theme of this day for you is reach beyond. I don't feel in a position to tell you what that means for you. But for me to reach beyond my conditioned historical self limitations, I need to be in touch with my intuitive side. And one of the things that helped me to do that is some measure of stillness inside. And I don't want to be misunderstood here. Somebody might think there and say, well, maybe one of you sits there and thinks, yeah, that's easy for him to say, stillness. He was sitting with his legs crossed for 16 years. <laughs> but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying every single one of you 
has moments in your day where things quieten down a bit inside. And that's different for different people when that happens and how that happens. Some people tell me early morning, first half hour before I really put myself together, put on the me costume, remind myself of all my problems and challenges and shortcomings. Before all that happens, then I'm open and more intuitive. Some people tell me, out with a dog, playing with kids. Kids and animals are not very impressed with our conceptual structures. <laughs> they're not so impressed with your intellectual brilliance, but they're very, very attuned to whether you're present or not, whether you're actually seeing them or just looking at them, whether you're actually with it when you're touching them, or whether you're just doing a perfunctory physical movement. Yeah? Gardening. In my, <laughs> this is a bit silly, but before I came across meditation, the only way my mind would still itself would be sex, alcohol, or long distance running. <laughs> it's rather inconvenient. You can't always go after one of those three. <laughs> So I found this, this thing, wow, meditation, you can just sit still, you have all these problems, and then you go to a quiet aspect of your mind. You find the stillness between your thoughts. You find the peace that's always there. And it's not a matter of swatting all your thoughts with a fly swat. It's a matter of discovering I'm not thinking all the time. When I'm not thinking, I'm still there. That's peaceful. It's not exciting, it's not special, it's not sensational. So it requires some training to attune to it. But it's certainly nothing that nobody with an average mind can't attune to. I'm kind of going off a bit on this stillness theme here, but it's because I feel so strongly about it. So let's go back to my biography. Starry-eyed, young, idealist, born-again Buddhist. I gave away everything I owned in Sweden, paid my student loan, and I was rather surprised at how happy that made me. This process took about a month, and I never thought of myself as somebody who has a lot of attachment to their physical belongings. But just giving it all away was just like I was this bubbly, caffeinated... <laughs> I was feeling like that for a whole month. And uh, the departure wasn't as dramatic as you might think, because my parent, I knew my parents would come, I was hoping they would be in Thailand when I, uh, when I ordained as a monk a year later, and that's the way it happened. I came to the monastery. Probably should say something about the daily life. There is a question people always ask. A normal day in a forest monastery in Thailand, you live in a jungle, you live in little huts. Most of them stand on two, two and a half meter high pillars to keep the rats and the snakes away. Uh, there's small huts, maybe six, eight square meters. Uh, there's a bell at three o'clock in the morning. You gather at 3.30. You meditate together. Those of you who've been to Thailand, you know that Thai, the Thai psyche has a devotional streak. They like their ceremonies. So we had a fair amount of ceremony in the monastery too, which is a bit weird for a Swedish person because we don't really do ceremony in Sweden. You get there to this beautiful little, you'd walk outside the jungle, a bit of a breeze. There were no walls to the building, just a roof, floor. And we'd bow to this Buddha three times. And in the beginning it felt really weird. But little by little I just realized there was one part of me, call it a religious, spiritual part if you like, one part of me just growingly felt, isn't it wonderful? I'm not quite sure what I'm bowing to. I don't think it's that brass statue up there, because that's just a brass statue. But just this movement of bowing to something bigger than my screaming ego. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to even start talking about what that is, because I use my words and you use yours, or maybe you can't relate to what I'm describing. But for those of you who can relate to it, isn't it wonderful? There's something bigger out there there's a bigger intelligence at work than my screaming, conditioned, self-centered personality. <laughs> uh, we'd sing a bit, 
we'd sing the chant, the Buddha, he, as opposed to Jesus, who was killed so early, the Buddha, after his awakening, he had 40 years, 45 years, where he walked up and down the Ganges Valley and answered questions. He basically never gave a sermon, but he stopped on his walks and he answered questions. And there was a tradition for monks and nuns in the time of the Buddha to memorize what he said. And then it was written down much later, but a fairly accurate account, I believe. So we'd sing these uh, discourses, suttas, English in Thai, sometimes in Pali, the written language of the scriptures. And then we'd meditate. I was funny, most of us would just sit and be aware of our breath. It's a very simple process. Slowly realize most of my problems arise because I believe in my own thoughts. <laughs> so is there some way I cannot believe automatically in all my own thoughts? Well, I guess I need another channel on my inner remote control. Okay, there's this body hanging below my head. <laughs> Maybe I could pay some attention to this body thing that's hanging below my head. Oh yeah, it breathes. There's a rhythm to it. I can follow that. And if I keep following that rhythm of breathing, things start to quiet down. How wonderful! So that's what most of us did. It's intellectually a very unsatisfying thing to talk about or explain. It's a hard sell, but the actual effects of it are wonderful. These frustrated Swedish journalists trying to make something interesting when they interview me, and they'll ask, OK, so 16 years as a Buddhist monk, what's the most valuable thing that you got out of it? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, well, I don't really believe all my thoughts anymore. <laughs> Try to make an interesting newspaper article out of that. <laughs> funny thing, really funny things would happen when we'd sit and meditate. The villages, this is the poorest part of Thailand. As in many countries, the poorer areas of a country is often the most religious. So the villages around the monastery, they didn't have cinemas, but sometimes an, uh, mobile cinemas would come and they'd put up a big screen and put out chairs and they'd show movies all night. And the later at night, the Ron shear the movies. <laughs> so by the time we'd sit there and meditate and be rather, you know, like all very, uh, almost sacred, hmm, we'd hear these sounds, like sighs, uh, shrieks. <laughs> it was very clearly the sounds of your average porn movie. <laughs> and I just loved the kind of paradox of it. Here we all sit, celibate, <laughs> following hundreds of rules, never even killing an ant or a mosquito, not even touching money, and then you have the village next to us with just these raw sighs and shrieks. <laughs> uh, and I like that about Buddhism. It was never a puritanical or fundamentalist religion. The Buddha was quite specific. He said, even a wonderful idea, even an absolutely blameless, beautiful, wonderful idea, hold it lightly. Even holding on, clutching on, identifying too much with a wonderful idea can bring you suffering. So after the morning meditation, we'd go arms round, as we didn't have any money, we weren't allowed to cook, we weren't allowed to store food overnight, we were completely dependent on other people for our food. And you may think, that's rather weird. Shouldn't you try to be as little of a burden on country and try to be independent? Well, actually, no. The Buddha set it up in a different way. He thought, I want to have a mechanism to control that the monks and nuns are living in a way that's inspiring to people. And I want people to have a way of signaling, no, we don't like the way you're living. So, because monks and nuns aren't really supposed to cook or store food from yesterday, if lay people stop giving them food, they don't eat. That's a fairly short, sharp signal <laughs> to change your ways. And on the whole, it's worked. Now, of course, like in most religions, most monks and nuns don't live after all these rules. They're rather archaic and uh, impractical, many of them. But that's one of the aspects of the forest tradition. They keep all the rules. So you go out. I loved it. It was the best part of the day often for me. You go out, 
groups of five or six monks, nuns. You get fed. Often you get quite simple food. Some Western monks would make the mistake of saying thank you when they were given food. And the lay people in the villages who gave us food, they'd be upset. I'm not giving this to you as a person. I'm giving it because you represent something that I honor, that I hold in high esteem. Real wonderful culture clashes. So one of my best moments in my looking back, my year in India when I was a lay person, an economist there, my Indian neighbors, they felt so sorry for me because I was alone every night. <laughs> and of course, I'd been at work the whole day, so I was quite pleased to just read my books and have a few beers and chill. <laughs> but they'd come over and say, come on, come on, have, have dinner with us. And I'd go over and have dinner a couple of times a week. And the way I was brought up, you say, thank you for dinner. So that's what I did every time with my neighbors. And they were Indian. And one day the husband would just say, could you please stop thanking us every time we invite you over to dinner? If we human beings were to thank each other for all we do for each other, there'd be no end to it. <laughs> that was like one of these whoa, cultural twists, so different from my own culture, but it was so beautiful in its own context. Mm. We'd come back, the food that was given was collectively owned, shared, the monks would eat quietly, the lay people, they would eat in the kitchen. The, the monastery functioned as a social center. The people of working age, they were usually in Bangkok working on building sites. So the grandparents were looking after the rice paddies in the villages. So the grandmothers, they would bring the grandkids to the monastery in the morning, do some nice vegetarian cooking because they knew we liked that, the Westerners and they do a few really spicy dishes that they liked as well. I maybe I haven't been clear about this, but I chose a monastery in Thailand where the working language was English, just like at Ericsson here. So most of the monks were Westerners, but far from all of them. It was rather funny. I imagine I, have, I had a lot of experiences very similar to your experiences working in a kind of global outfit in Sweden. Like when the Japanese monk was angry in English, it looked and sounded very differently from when the Italian monk was <laughs> angry <laughs> in English. <laughs> and if you think it was all peace and serenity, no, no. One of the visitors who stayed for a while had a really nice analysis of us monks. He said, under those shaved heads, I see a lot of hairy brains. <laughs> and that's another answer I give when people ask, so what do you value the most from what you learned from all those years? Social training. Perhaps somewhat unexpected. Some of you may have images of monastery, okay, just be left on your own, don't have to deal with other people. No. Unwittingly, unconsciously, I had actually signed up for living in a collective with a group of most eccentric people I've ever met. Misfits, most of them. <laughs> Junkies. Anarcho-punks from Berlin <laughs> who used to make a living stealing car stereos. <laughs> Walking around in black on the streets of Berlin ripping off people's car stereos. And of course, some glorious personalities as well the most grand-hearted, wise people I've ever met. They were monks and nuns. And I'll never forget them. I go and see them when I can, because it makes me feel so good. Mm -hmm. Our abbot in Thailand was absolutely wonderful. He was an Englishman. And he was so articulate and intelligent and empathetic. So like for seven years I was just mesmerized. Everything he said just seemed so worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And we had fun. It might sound serious, celibacy, no money, eating once a day, but no, we had fun. Tea time was very big. You have your meal at nine o'clock in the morning, that's the only meal for the day. Then you have free time, and three to five you do some physical work, and five o'clock it's tea time. You bet we were interested in something hot and sweet. <laughs> and it was often a time where our abbot would play. Tell us things, read things, muse, speculate. And this day he was drinking his tea and he was saying, 
Well, it seems to me that it's fair to say that red wine is the drink of Christians. And, yeah, tea is probably the drink of Buddhists. And it's probably fair to say that coffee is the drink of Islam. And we had this one Canadian monk who had a very serious addiction to Nescafe, even more serious than my addiction to Nescafe. <laughs> and when the, this Canadian monk heard this, he took a split second and just, Allah Akbar! <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of a nice thing when you live in a collective, in a closely knit community. You can't play those games of, I've got it together, I know what I'm doing, I'm a, I'm a very got it together kind of person. Because <laughs> you're living together all the time, so you have to, you kind of reveal yourself. And also this cultural mix where a bunch of Westerners get their jaws into an old Eastern tradition. Thai monks would often be fairly happy to do what their teacher said. The paradigm they would bring when they came to the monastery would be the paradigm of the family. Okay, this is what the teacher says, I'll do that. We Westerners, we're not as trusting. We would bring the paradigm work. And the teacher, he's the boss. <laughs> and I'm not sure I want to do what he says. And this had some funny twists. Like all these rules that are 2,500 years old, some of these legal Western minds started to actually check them out in detail. And this German monk was a brilliant legal mind. He noticed that, well, actually, in this passage in the scriptures, it says, if you've done some physical work, you can have sugar and molasses and honey in the afternoon. And then in this scripture, it says, if you're having troubles with your digestion, you're allowed to eat beans in the afternoon given that these beans are not considered food by normal people. You follow? So like, he thought, okay, beans, cocoa beans plus sugar, we have dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> this means dark chocolate is allowable whenever you like. And if you only eat once a day, whatever you're allowed to chew on outside of that one meal becomes very hard currency. <laughs> So parents and friends would start to send little sweet packages with dark chocolate. And since we didn't have a fridge, of course, it looked rather surreal when it arrived in funny shapes. And our abbot, he also he was clever enough to see how one of the problems with Westerners is we don't like ourselves so much. Mm. I noticed that Thai people basically like themselves and I didn't like myself so much. And I had this harsh voice inside, which was clearly critical and unforgiving when I did small mistakes. And Thai people didn't seem to have that. And our abbot, he picked up on this and he said, you know, with this guilt and shame thing that we Westerners tend to do to ourselves, and on top of that we live a celibate life with almost no sensual pleasures allowed, if you do choose to do a little sensual indulgence, do it with a friend so you don't get that guilty, shameful feeling afterwards. <laughs> so one evening I'd be on my way from the evening meditation, walking on this jungle path. A friend of mine came up and said, Hey, Natika, wonderful, I met you. I got some chocolate today and I've been looking for somebody to share it with all evening. <laughs> so on this whole, one of the things that I noticed was I found it easier to learn things through simile than abstraction. And some of my teachers were great with similes. And one teacher, because we were frustrated often, we found it really difficult to be with each other, we Westerners. And one day our teacher said, hey guys, you know what? We're like pebbles on the beach. We're like little pebbles on the beach and the waves come rolling in. When we first get to the shore, we're rather edgy, sharp. And then as we lay there and we rub up against each other, and it's not comfortable, but we keep doing it, slowly we start to rounden. And we start to get polished, and we start to pick up the light from the sun, and we start to shine. For me that was such a, ah, oh, that's another way of looking at the unavoidable problems of being one human amongst many. That's another way of looking at, I don't want other people to bother me. And I had this pathological problem of falling asleep when I tried to meditate. It was really bad. 
really, really, I mean, many had it, but I had it worse than anybody else. <laughs> a bunch of us would get together in the afternoons to do some meditation in this outside, outside of the jungle meditation hall. I'd sit at the back because I was the recent arrival. I'd sit there and I'd think, what just happened? Somebody just beat me over the forehead. That's impossible. We're just sitting here quietly meditating. But I can feel it. My forehead is throbbing with pain. I gotta look. No, I don't wanna look. I at least wanna pretend that I'm meditating, even if I'm just sitting here thinking right now. No, I gotta look. And then I opened my eyes and my head was here. <laughs> I just kind of fallen asleep and <laughs> I'm falling forwards and boom, my forehead into the floor. <laughs> and so a fair question is, okay, so you kept falling asleep when you meditated, so that wasn't really your thing then, was it? So why was it useful? What did you learn then, being a Buddhist monk? And one of the ways we learned, I would say, was very unglamorous. This uh, rather charismatic Thai teacher who created the tradition I belong to. He attracted a lot of hippies in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, the overlanders from Europe. And then they go to India and then they come to Thailand to get healthy and get well. He was a lovely man. He had a very broad smile that was semi-permanent. They call him the bullfrog because he looked like a bullfrog in this kind of <laughs> broad, semi-permanent smile. And one, one time he would say, you know what? When you come to a forest monastery, what you're learning here is nothing esoteric, it's nothing up in the clouds, it's earthworm wisdom. So that's, I like that. What's earthworm wisdom? I'll give you a simple example of what earthworm wisdom was for me. The second year as a monk, I was offered to go and live with Thai monks. And I wanted to do that because it seemed the right thing to do. I wanted to learn Thai, and I liked Thai people. They were much easier to live with than Western people. And my teacher, I asked, where do you want to go? And I said, you choose. I trust you. You know what's out there. And so he sent me to one of the absolutely poorest monasteries in the whole group, and there was a hundred monasteries. No Westerner had survived there more than a month previously. Well, it wasn't a Westerner. It was a Japanese monk. And we all know how patient Japanese can be. <laughs> but this Japanese monk had only survived a month. And I was intending to be there for a year. Uh, yeah, Very ugly place. Everything was ugly about it. Unpainted concrete meditation hall, corrugated iron roof, kitsch ugly Buddha, kitsch ugly candles, kitsch ugly plastic flowers. And the food was horrible. And in the forest tradition, there's a tendency that the monks and the nuns, they like their teacher fairly stern and tough. That doesn't work so well for Westerners, but Thais tend to like that. So this teacher, he decided that when the food was presented, we'd sit on a podium a bit like this one, and the food would be offered. And he would put some of each dish in his uh, arms bowl that you eat from. And then he would ask for a bucket, uh, use a normal plastic bucket, and he'd take the bucket and he'd put all these different dishes in the bucket and then he'd give it a good stir. <laughs> and then he'd say, ah, you monks, you shouldn't follow your preferences too much. You need to train yourself in being happy with what you're given. <laughs> and the Thai monks, they really got off on it. Wow, our teacher's tough. He's really tough. And I just sat there. I mean, I could hard to find food I could eat even when it was separated. Fish out a bit of a sardine, <laughs> live mainly on cakes and bananas and rice. Anyway, not as if this wasn't hard enough. On top of that, every day at meal time, two dogs would come up. And I, I've been traumatized by dog saliva because when I was in gymnasium, high school, I had a girlfriend who had a boxer at home. And this boxer used to have a long thing of saliva hanging from one of its. Uh, we call this the edge of the mouth. And when it turned quickly, that tended to go very horizontal lateral. <laughs> and you really had to stay away. So we've never had dogs, and I'm a bit kind of sensitive around these things. So I really don't like dog saliva. It goes way back, as you understand. 
And these two dogs happily came in at the meal time and they looked up and laid their heads on this little podium and hoped for some food from the monks. And of course, a few monks would give them food. I was indignant. I was upset. I was infuriated. <laughs> How dare they? How can they? What would the lay people say if they saw their offerings of food being given to dogs? This is not respectful. This makes no sense. Why don't we close the doors to the meditation hall, at least for the meal? We need a dignified setting. I was really working myself up. And of course, often the dogs left a little bit of dog saliva on this little podium, on this concrete, polished concrete surface. And it so happened that often the light would shine in from outside, just at the spot where there was some dog saliva in front of me. <laughs> and can you see how I was... This is a classical example of creating your own suffering. The Buddha said very clearly, it seems in the beginning to us as if suffering is happening to us because of other people, because of circumstances we can't uh, do much about. But he said, actually, that's not the way it works. The suffering occurs because we make resistance inside here. We make resistance inside against things that we have little influence over. Mm. So this is a classical example of earthworm knowledge. Little by little, day after day, I was working myself up and having a miserable meal time, creating division between myself and the other monks, being very critical of it all, and being a real jerk. <laughs> And the only thing that was happening there was I was sitting in my subjectively created inferno every day. The other monks seemed happy enough. They'd throw the dog some food or not, whatever. And then it's like, this is a classical, you've all been through this process, I know it. One day you're just so tired of yourself doing this same pattern over and over again, always ending up at a miserable place. And just the sheer tired upness makes you think, okay, I'll try something different today. I dig out a little piece of hairy buffalo meat and I'd throw it to the dogs. And the dog was really happy and a bit surprised. There never used to be any food from that pale monk. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, this is very clearly the process of becoming a reasonably happy, harmonious human being. We don't have to accumulate a lot of esoteric, profound knowledge we have to learn to let go. What do we let go of? We let go of the thoughts that cause us harm. And if you want to know what those thoughts are, look for the thoughts with a should in it. <laughs> the thoughts that say, he shouldn't have done that, they shouldn't be like this, why should it always be me that has to? Why do I never get to? Why do they always say? Hmm? Can you hear that? Like you're creating a, an opposition between reality. It's almost like we're taking a God position. I'm God, and I know how things should be, and things are not the way they should be, and I'm going to be fairly pissed off until things turn out the way they should be, according to me. <laughs> it's a totally unreasonable position, but it happens for us all. It's just the way the human mind is structured. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have ideas of how things should be. It's a lovely capacity humans have. We can think of what a perfect society is like, we can think of what a perfect friend is like, a perfect partner. We can all say ten qualities that we'd really like to have more of. That's fine. It's when we then take the next step and demand that reality fit in with our ideal. That's when we get into trouble. Another way you might misunderstand me when I'm speaking like this is thinking that here comes another of those public speakers and he says, think positive, think, oh how lovely, the Thai monks get to feed the dog, the dog's happy, the Thai monks are happy, everybody's happy, except me. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, that never worked for me. Positive thinking doesn't really work for me in that way. But what I noticed, what does work is, let go of the thought that's harming me. If I'm sitting here being very indignant and upset about the way the mealtime happens in this monastery, I create my own little personal hell, day after day, and I don't have to do that. 
And I don't have to put in any new, better, more positive thoughts. I can just let go of the thoughts. So what do I do then? How does one let go of a thought? Well, with Buddhist meditation practice, it's very simple. You just go to something other than thought. The most obvious thing being body. Am I still breathing? Yeah, I'm still breathing. Can I feel the weight of my body against what I'm sitting on? Yeah, I can feel that. Can I feel the clothes hanging on to my body? Yeah, I feel that. Can I feel the air touching the bits of my body that are exposed? Hands, face, no, yeah, I feel that. So, this is intellectually rather uninteresting. As an experience, it's transformative. You are no longer a slave to your own thinking. You can choose to go with the flow of thought or step out of it. And quite a lot of the time it's actually a very good idea to step out of it. <laughs> huh? There's a wonderful story in Japanese tradition with this... There's a war on in Japan and the front is coming closer to the monastery and all the monks and nuns are rushing away from the monastery because they're scared of the fight and the war. But there's this one nun and she's just chilled out forever, what we in Buddhism call enlightened. <laughs> So she sits there and she meditates and she has no problems and will never have any again. And the front comes to the monastery, the samurai comes in, this big fierce warrior and he raises his sword and he says, tell me about heaven or hell or I'm going to chop your head off. And she looks at him and, hmm, now tell me, why would I explain about heaven and hell to a Arrogant, inflated, dirty, stinking, no gooder like you. <laughs> and the samurai is just furious. He's got anger boiling in his veins. His face is all red and hard. And the nun, she looks at him and she says, That's hell. <laughs> And the samurai is wise enough to understand that this little nun just risked her life to show him something very, very important. We do create our own heaven and our own hell by what thoughts we believe. He just created his own hell by believing the thoughts, How dare she! Uh -huh. So he's overwhelmed with gratitude and his face softens, his shoulders soften, he opens and the nun points at him again as she says, and that's heaven. Mm. So this is not a commentary on your beliefs on heaven and hell after life. I have, no, I have no opinion on that. But what is sure is that we are creating our own heaven and hells in this very life. Mm. And when you see it, it's daunting. It's, it's like a necessary step in human development to go from the stage of, it's their fault. <laughs> if my parents, my children, my siblings, my boss, the politicians, the religious people, the non-religious people, the scientists, the engineers, the Ericsson people, if they didn't do what they did, I would be a happy person. That's the, the less developed stage of human uh, development. And there comes a day where you have to face the fact that, okay, let's look at that finger pointing the blame, the hand pointing the blame. In which direction do most of the fingers point? <laughs> well, actually they seem to be pointing at me. Maybe there's something I'm doing that actually makes the situation much worse. Maybe there's something I could stop doing, and so it wouldn't be so heavy. And it's embarrassing and it's awkward to have to admit that actually I'm the one who's creating psychological suffering for me. Other people do what they do, the weather does what it does, the economy does what it does. I can't affect that that much. And actually when you start to feel what it feels like to try to control everybody else all the time, you realize this is deeply unpleasant. I don't want to live my life trying to control everybody else. But what I can have a certain influence over is this one. Yeah? And I'm not saying I can have an influence in the way of 
only thinking beautiful, perfect thoughts or only feeling wonderful, positive, buoyant emotions. No. I have an influence over where I put my attention. And when my attention has lingered with thoughts that are creating psychological suffering for myself, I can choose to stop attending to them. It's a very small step, but it makes a big difference. And it's embarrassing, because it's hard to own up to the fact that actually it's me doing it. I am not a victim. It's nice to feel a victim, because you're helpless, you can't do anything, you can just complain. But nobody's a victim in that way. And that's what's so embarrassing, you realize, oh dear, it's actually me generating all this intensity and suffering for myself. So I'm going on about this a bit, because it's such a valuable insight. And I heard this wonderful story of letting go. Supposedly some man walking along a side of a mountain, a very narrow path, and he slips. And as he slips, he catches on to a, a tree root on this cliff face. It's not a religious person. And he hangs there and he realizes he's got nowhere else to turn. He's about to die because his arms are getting so tired. So he faces to heaven and says, Hello, hello, God, are you up there? Help me! <laughs> and after a while you hear, Hello, I'm God. Yes, I can help you. But you have to do exactly as I say. Whatever, whatever, anything, anything, just tell me, God. Let go. <laughs> um, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> so if you want to know what thought is creating suffering for yourself, look for the ones with a should in it. Look for the ones that you really don't want to let go of. And the ones you really don't want to let go of is usually something along the lines of, it's their fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. They shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have had to do this. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, once I get going on this track, I just can't stop myself. Let's get back to the biography now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll take another ten minutes to round off. Where should I go? After five years of being a monk, there was the opportunity to do what you like. For the first five years, you're like a trainee. And after five years, you can do what you like. So I decided I'm going to be a hermit. I'd read all the biographies of the great masters. They seemed to be alone in the forest. I thought, that's what I'll do. And there was some giggling and laughing at this, because I was a fairly essential and extrovert monk. So they thought, what are you going to do all the time in your hut, all alone? And I had this, it was the happiest year of my life. Living in a hut in a completely different part of Thailand. Happened to be when my parents did their annual visit. I did the mistake of letting them drive me there. Well, that wasn't a mistake, but taking them up to the hut. It had, was made of bamboo, had withstood about three rainy seasons. since it was all dilapidated and grey and awful. My mother said, are you sure about this? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was still a starry-eyed, born-again Buddhist. And uh, during this year I had to shave my, my head myself. Normally we shaved each other's head because it's much easier. And we shaved our head, new moon, full moon, twice a month. I'd hung up my little toiletry bag in a little branch by the river, or a little riverlet. I'd kneel down, put my little small mirror, just this big, put it with this Velcro onto my toiletry bag. And I'd kneel down and I'd put leather in my head. And then I kind of looked my face in the mirror. I could only see this bit. Whew. I've got so coarse skin, and it's kind of blotchy. It's red, it's brown, it's pale. Could it make up, by, make up its mind, my skin? Could be brown like the Thais, that would be nice. Or even pale like the English monks, that would be all right too. But this is blotchy, that's not pretty. And all the, the scars from all the acne I had as a young man, I can still see it. Terrible. And I've got this funny thing at the further end of my nose. It's like a little globe there, like a little sphere. That's really ugly. Why couldn't I have a straight, beautiful nose? I was a hermit. I had all day to myself. <laughs> and then something from the inside said, 
completely out of nowhere, it said, that's funny, I feel much more beautiful than I look. <laughs> so I would, I would present that as an extremely shorthand reference in terms of what ethics does. I still couldn't stay awake for an hour's meditation after six years. But I'd lived an impeccable life. I hadn't hurt the smallest creature intentionally. I hadn't said anything that I regretted. I hadn't done anything that I deeply regretted. I'd lived a good life. And the effect of it was things started to brighten on the inside. And the effect of that was feeling beautiful on the inside. And when you get to my age, 52, you're not getting any prettier on the outside anymore. <laughs> it's a constant battle against gravity, and it's a losing battle against gravity. But the inside can get more beautiful until our last breath. And I find that a really uplifting reminder. And I think, I think that we all know that. And it's easier to see in others than ourselves. But just as a, as a sweet kind of skillful means. Just that reference, inner beauty. It's really, I find that very meaningful. And for the Swedish people, this is not so relevant for the Asians, but for the Swedish people here, I'd like to present a lovely, a lovely little teaching. Um, going back to the monastery with all the Farangs, all the foreigners, a couple of evenings a week, our teacher, he would offer a, a presentation, a, a talk after the evening meditation. And he'd always come up with these surprising references. And one evening he was telling us about an interview that BBC made with the Thai king. And the Thai king, he's been educated in Switzerland, in the West, so he's fairly informed about Western culture. And this interviewer from BBC said, well, as you know, we have original sin in Christianity. For those of you Swedish people who don't know what that is, Arvs sinned. And so the BBC journalist asked the, the Thai king, how do you see that as Buddhists? And the Thai king is a fairly modest man, and he just quietly said, well, as Buddhists we see things differently. We believe in original purity. Like when I heard that, I was just like, oh yes, <laughs> give me more. <laughs> Am I allowed to at least open the door to the possibility that the center, the core, the essence of each one of us, all of you, everybody, is indestructibly innocent, pure, unproblematic? For a Swedish person, that's quite a big deal. <laughs> So that was one of those moments where something just opened up in me. It's, yeah, I'll never forget that. Hmm. Take a few minutes to just run through the chronography. I don't know if it's interesting, but if I don't say it, a lot of people come up and ask what happened then. After my year as a hermit, I walked all the way back to my monastery, 500 kilometers, that's a two-hour talk just in itself. And I slowly grew uh, aware that I was really tired of living with just men. So I decided to move to England after seven years in Thailand. This tradition was global, they'd created monasteries in many different countries. And in England they'd created a very nice possibility for women to live as monastics. I haven't spoken much about nuns in Thailand because there's not an easy situation for women in Thailand who want to live as Buddhist full-time. But in the West, my tradition had created a really nice form for women which was almost equal to men. And I really enjoyed living with monks and nuns. It was funny. Imagine the transition, seven years in Thailand, not having come back to the West once. Basically, a forest monk in Thailand, you're treated like a gift from the gods. People walk around with super respect all the time. And then you come to England. First time on arms round, we would walk to the local town near the monastery. It was called Midhurst. This is West Sussex. 
on our way to town, there's a white van that drives by. And there's a cliche, cliche in English culture called the white van man. It's the assumption of an unpolished, unreliable, somewhat verbally abusive carpenter <laughs> or plumber. <laughs> and he's driving a white van. <laughs> and this was such a man, I believe. Because when he drove by us, he just leaned out the window and screamed, Get yourself a fucking job, mate! <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, now I've been a gift from the gods for seven years. I think it's time to be a freak, a penniless freak with a skirt, funny hairdo and confused sexual identity. <laughs> that sounds like good Buddhist practice. There's a lot to let go of there. England was lovely. They treat their eccentrics well. But after seven years in England, I was... I'm back in my MBA role a little bit, spending a lot of time in the office, filling in the whiteboard, answering mails, answering the phone, planning the activities. So I chose to move to Switzerland. And as most of you know, the Swiss, they do take care of things and organize things rather well. So I didn't have to do that. And after about a year and a half in Switzerland, and by this time I'd been a monk for 15 years, and I was actually able to stay awake for a whole hour with my legs crossed. <laughs> Hallelujah! On a regular basis. So sitting in my lovely room one afternoon, there's just this same voice of intuition bubbling up saying, it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. And this time I was a middle-aged man. I had a lot more to lose. I had quite an idyllic life on many levels. So I was a bit more cautious and slow in following my intuition. I talked to monks and nuns that I trusted. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just following an impulse. But I could see there were some rather sweet signs. We had like once a week in the Swiss monastery, we had wandering day, you know, go out and hike. You make your own picnic lunch after breakfast, get a backpack, go alone or in little pairs. I'd usually go alone. I loved the high mountains. And the abbot complained when I'd been there for two, year, two years. He said, you've seen more peaks in two years than I have in 16 years. <laughs> and a friend in Sweden had sent me a CD with uh, his favorite hundred songs of the last 15 years. And in Switzerland, I got my first PC. We had broadband there, so it was a bit more free. And mo many of the monks and nuns, we had little MP3 players because we recorded our talks, we listened to other monks and nuns and teachers' talks. So I downloaded this music to my little MP3 player, I walked up with my packed lunch, snowshoes, got up on a peak with a wonderful view, ate my lunch, started to listening to this modern music, and as you can imagine, when you've listened to hardly any modern music in 15 years, it, it, it affects you. And one of the first songs was Shakira's Hips Don't Lie. <laughs> and I call it, it was a very warm day and I was alone and I'd taken everything off except my skirt and my walking boots. <laughs> so there I was, a lone celibate monk on the mountaintop in the snow, dancing to Shakira with a bare chest and a shirt. <laughs> and the thought arose, I think my celibate life is coming to an end. <laughs> so, and my mother, she was wise as usual when I called home and said, it's over, I'm coming back to Sweden. Monk's life is finished. She said, yeah, you're a bit young to be living as a, you're a bit young for a senior citizen. <laughs> she felt living in the monastery in Switzerland was like being in an old people's home, you know. You got your slippers outside your room, you go down to the basement, ground floor, have some breakfast, back up, lunch, go down, back up. So I'm aware of, in three minutes' time, we have to finish. And uh, I stopped being a monk after 16 years. I had a bit of a misery of it the first three years. Uh, I'm slowly crawled out of the, of the pit I dug for myself coming back to Sweden. Um, Yeah, it's been a long trip. The best thing that's happened has been meeting a woman, and she's been the key success factor for me turning into a reasonably responsible and contributory fellow human being. 
And uh, some weird twist of fate, I end up getting to do this, sharing what's closest to my heart with groups like you, who sit and listen and look like you're really listening. And I'm thanking you for that. I want to stop there. Thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot, Bjorn. Thank you. We don't actually, because I was told I have to stop at no, 20. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> Wonderful. I'm all for it. Yes. Yeah, you, you decide. Let's hear a question. The stupid questions are the best because everybody's thinking them, but nobody dares saying them. Mm. I think we are overwhelmed with your story. It certainly felt like people were listening. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi. Hi. My name is Priyanki. Wonderful. Uh, yes. Uh, what is your What is your origin, Priyanki? I come from India. What What state? Uh, Gujarat. Wonderful. From where Krishna comes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, you in your story you mentioned mm. about a girl. Yeah. Uh, with whom you fall in love, mm. and at that time you were not maybe this much wiser, I believe. So you're you are very did. true, very true. <laughs> you did not express your feelings, but over the time, mm. what did you think about her? And did you ever thought that you should go back to her because you decided to end this monk, monk life yeah. and come back to you know what we mm. say usual mm. human mm. life? Mm. So. <laughs> Yeah, for, I'm for, very human. <laughs> <laughs> no, for us in India, the spirituality is so intertwined in our yeah, daily lives yeah, that yeah. we don't differentiate no, among exactly. life something yeah, special, actually. Yeah, yeah. So for us, uh, grasping that concept is little hard yeah, uh, because we yeah. think, uh, as you said, it, our thoughts makes us monk or mm, uh, no monk, mm, you know. Mm. So th that, that's fine. Every, everybody comes from different cultures, so we mm. understand that. Mm. But now, as per your story, what did you think about that girl? Uh, because, oh. And did you ever thought to tell her, you know, because I think it, is, it will be very nice mm. for her to know mm. that somebody loved her so much. She knew that when we were together. Yeah. Okay. Um, with uh, the modern world, you can find anybody no matter how long it was. So I actually found her when I was, uh, had been a monk for 15 years. She had yeah. been through a terrible accident, car accident. She, her husband took care of her. She was uh, unconscious. I agree with your statement that the distinction between a religious life and non-religious life is unnecessary. I certainly stand up in any assembly and say, I'm still a spiritual person. Yes. Right now my spiritual life is about being part of a small family, uh, working, taking care of the people I care for, sharing what I possibly have that's worth, that's valuable to other people. So I feel no less religious. The outer form is not so religious, but I was never into the outer form. Yes, mm. yes thank, thank you. you. Hey, thank hey. you for your uh, for sharing your experience. Thank you. Uh, my question was uh, uh, one of the last sentences you said about the last uh, three years that you were mm. struggling after you yeah. decided to yeah. uh, uh, not being a monk yeah. anymore. Yeah. Uh, we have, as humans, we have the tendency to go back to our comfort zones, and yeah. I guess that yeah. was yeah. yours. Uh, but uh, my question is, what what made you? not go back and continue to struggle, because three years is quite a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, there were different components. One component is I got a very weird illness my last year as a monk. It's an autoimmune disease which meant my blood didn't coagulate anymore. So that was very serious, and all the doctors, they wanted to... One of the things they did was they treated me with a lot of cortisone. So I lost the ability to sleep well. So, you know, after a year of not sleeping well, you know, most of us aren't as bright as we could be. <coughs> um, my consciousness had developed in a very we form. I'd been part of a collective for so long, and I'm, I'm just geared towards what can I offer to the group? Which bit can I contribute? And then I come back to a highly individualistic society like Sweden, which had grown much more individualistic when I'd been away. 
some of my old business school friends would say, well, how are you going to maintain and promote your personal trademark? <laughs> I didn't know I had one. <laughs> uh, and they said, what's your strategy now, professionally? Well, my strategy is to walk through the doors that open. It doesn't go down well with MBAs. <laughs> it's worked for me, because that's why I'm here today. Some people at Ericsson, they open a door and I walk through it. And so, yes, there was often the whispering voice inside the first two years especially. Maybe I made a mistake. I'm not really suitable for being out here. But what I felt with that was there was an element of failure. I can't make it out here. So it was like, that's the wrong reason to go back. It's possible that I made a mistake, but if I return to the monastery, I want it to be because I say yes to that. This is what I want to do, not because I can't hack it out there. And I'm still part of the monasteries. I had a wonderful moment with my girlfriend three years ago. I took her to the English monastery. She's a kind of low-income single mom for most of her adult life. We'd sit in the temple. The monks and nuns would get their food in the kitchen, everything quiet. And she started crying, and I didn't say anything because it seemed the right, didn't seem the right place. We had our lunch in the garden, and I asked her, why did you cry? And she said, well... I've been a single mom, not so much income, I've been very busy for many years, but when I come into this completely still room, there's a tangible stillness and silence in the meditation hall, I realize I've been longing for this for so long, there just hasn't been time for it. That's like a wonderful moment for me, wow, she gets it, she gets what I've, one of the things I've valued so much. Yeah, so that's partly an answer, partly an exploration. Yeah. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Thank if you. you have to uh, live your life again, for example, if you have a second, uh, mm -hmm. second choice mm -hmm. and you can live your life again, would you live it in the same way? Uh, uh, or mm -hmm. if not, what mm -hmm. would you change? Je ne regrette rien. <laughs> what I mean is, <coughs> I think, one of the insights I made as a, as a Buddhist monk was, given who I was, at any given time, I could not have acted differently. I was a young, confused 19-year-old who was driven largely by other people's expectations and what seemed cool in the general public eye. So I ended up as an MBA because it, it was cool at the time. Um, so I think, and that's valid for all of us, given who we were at any given moment, we couldn't have acted differently. I think the notion of free will is extremely exaggerated in the West. <laughs> and so it doesn't make sense to think, could I have acted differently? No. Because in a way, I can also look at it very constructively and say, everything that I've experienced has constellated to bring me right here, right now. And I really find this a privilege. I couldn't even fantasize about a nicer way to make a living. It's like, hey, thank you, whoever's up there and made this happen. So how could I regret, you know, any of the previous steps since it took me to this? Yeah. Even, no, I'm not even going to go there, no. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now I, I would I, like you ask you not to leave. Thank you. Uh, thank we're going to end up this great day, I think, in a fantastic way. And this is to celebrate our winners of the Vexus 2013 competition. So as many as you can stay, please stay, and then we'll uh, go straight.